Okay. So I want everyone here to imagine that you have to buy a toy for a small child. We'll say a little girl. So you go to the toy store, you look around the shelves, everything in front of you is battery operated. That's okay. You pick up a box, you look at the box, reading it, seeing if it's appropriate, thinking in your head, oh, God, I hope this comes with batteries. But as you're reading the box, you see it says right on there, for ages six and up. What it doesn't say is that her hands need to work correctly for her to be able to play. Now, I want you to imagine that this little girl has a disability. This disability is affecting her mobility, her movement, the use of her arms, even her hands. She can't hold anything. That includes a fork, a toothbrush. She can't pick up a building block. She couldn't even press the button on that remote control car to get it to zoom around the room if she wanted to. She is prevented from an activity that we often don't think about in terms of accessibility, play. The secret about the whole thing was that if somebody in her life knew how to easily adapt the toy, she could participate, she could be an active participant in play, she could make that remote control car go everywhere. That's where we come in. All simple battery-operated toys have switches on the inside of the toy that can be accessed, and you can adapt them and make them accessible for people. The star of the show is a 25-cent monojack. And once you add this monojack, any hundreds of accessibility switches can be added to the toy for accessibility. Once added, the child could then use her foot, her head, or even make a simple aluminum foil switch to make the car go. She would be enabled to play with the toy. She would be able to explore her environment, perform cause and effect. She'd be able to be a kid. The, the idea of adapting devices or creating solutions when what was available didn't work is something I've always embraced. It's something I've carried over into my work as an occupational therapist. The use of technology to help facilitate independence for individuals to help improve their quality of life. Over 10 years ago, I met another like-minded individual, John Schimmel, when I was taking a class at NYU's ITP program. John is a programmer and fellow tinkerer that had the idea that individuals that required assistive technology for their independence should be involved in their design and production. With this idea, we started our own organization. We started to look at all of the newly available tools around us, such as 3D printers, laser cutters, Arduinos. We thought about how can we help improve, include this in the world of disability? How can we help people with and without disabilities look at the world differently around us? Around them, I should say. We wondered what happens when you teach a person with a disability to use a 3D printer. How is a person's mindset changed when they learn that they can solder and hack existing products? How is a family empowered when they learn they can adapt and hack their own devices for accessibility? Never was the idea of toy accessibility more obvious to us when a local children's hospital reached out to us. This was a long-term care facility with kids of all ages with significant physical impairments. Most of these kids could not walk, requiring the use of a wheelchair for mobility. They didn't have functional mobility, so they required assistance for all of their daily care needs, their bathing, their dressing, hitting a button on their TV remote. They were nonverbal requiring either assist to communicate or devices. They had a difficult time initiating conversation, making their needs known. They also could not initiate jokes, participate in humor, something kids like to do so much. They independently wanted to play with toys. So we talked about what kind of toys we were going to look at, and what I've learned by having a child of my own is that kids love farts. 
they do. I mean, the word's even kind of funny, right? Um, so what did they want to adapt? Accessible fart machines, okay? <laughs> so we bought a bunch. We added that mono jack, and now we had accessible fart machines. Accessible fart machines that these kids, once adapted, placed all around the nurses' stations. And then they waited and waited. And when a nurse would sit, they would hit their switch, and then we would hear that noise that everybody knows so well that kids find so funny. They were the ones telling the jokes. They were the ones participating in the humor in their own way through a device that was now accessible. The computer is the great equalizer. If you can access a computer, you can use a 3D printer, you can use a laser cutter, you can program an Arduino. Individuals with disabilities can learn to program. They can get jobs, make a living, be more independent. Never was the idea of inclusive making really brought to our attention so much until we met Steven. Steven was an individual with muscular dystrophy that wanted to play video games again. With muscular dystrophy, you lose your physical function as you age. You go from being a child that can walk and run to being an adult that is even dependent to breathe on their own. For Steven, this also meant that he went from being a child who could play video games to an adult that could not. He went from being an active participant to being a passive one. When he was a child, he would sit around with his brothers, his friends, and they would just play games. And when he got older, he was on the sideline. So he really wanted to game. And we have this idea of building for what somebody can do, not for what somebody can't do. And what Stephen could do is he could move his head and he could move one finger. And that's what the game controller was going to be developed for. So we ended up creating a software interface that we use with an Arduino, we eventually called a Capacita, that allows for however that individual uses their computer, they can then play the video game. That's the equalizer. So for Stephen, it meant using his head and his finger. For other individuals with disabilities, it could be using your eyes only, it could be using your head only, it could be using one toe, whatever they have. Over time, Stephen started going under the hood of the software, learning the code, learning the program. He was involved in its creation. He was part of his own solution. And over time, we would start to get lots of emails from Stephen, mostly with updates and suggestions on what we could do. We even got one email from his brother stating, he's beating me all the time now. What did you guys do? <laughs> but he was independent with playing his video games, and he gained that independence back. We've since given it to many, many individuals. This is actually a local individual playing with the software and the interface right now. And it really is, if they can use that computer, they can play video games. Again, it's that idea, develop for what, build for what they can do, not for what they can't. They can only move one finger, put everything underneath that finger. Let them use that finger to control the TV, turn the lights on and off, send emails, go on social media and keep up with friends and family. A kid can't access a toy, add a switch to the toy. Matthew is an individual that we worked with who is a normal tech-savvy teenager who happens to have cerebral palsy. Matthew is reliant on technology for his because of the impairments he's experiencing with his disability. He uses an iPad as his voice through text-to-speech. Matthew came to us as part of a summer workshop where we were teaching teenagers about using tools for making and accessibility. We taught him how to use his 3D printer, a computer-controlled laser cutter, and he wanted to make his own iPad case. He learned the software to control the laser cutter, cut out all the angles and vectors, every nook and cranny of the tightest wooden iPad case I've ever seen. Something that his iPad might never come out of again, but something that he created, and it was his 
and he loved it. The Arduino is one of the most widely used pieces of technology in the maker world. The Arduino is not made for individuals who are blind. I mean, the first test you do on an Arduino is see if you can make the LED blink. It's not really going to work much if you can't see the LED. Dr. Josh Miele from Berkeley at the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute wanted to be a maker with the Arduino, and he wanted to learn how to use the Arduino. Not only is it not made for blind people, but the typical computer screen readers do not work with the Arduino software. He came to New York City, and after some investigation, we figured out how he would be able to program the Arduino through accessibility options without sight, and how he would be able to wire the board with touch. He's now part of the maker community. He is now sharing that individual with other blind makers. He has a blind maker blog for the Arduino, as well as he will be holding open hack nights for blind individuals. So what can be done? What can you do? The truth about disability is that it's created by society and not by physiology. It's people that make cities inaccessible, make products that don't have accessibility options or adaptability to them. We need to think differently and creatively. For the designers, add accessibility to your products as much as possible. For the software engineers, educate the community about what is there, what accessibility is already in your product. People might not already know. That could be text-to-speech, switch scanning, change in contrast colors. For the user, go into the settings of your product that you already own. See what is there. Play with it. You won't break it, I promise. We need to learn about tinkering. We need to embrace it. We need to really be the maker of our own solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.